one of the first questions that immediately comes to mind is, well, do we need marine protected areas? Um, is the ho ocean healthy? Is it, is it uh, uh, in trouble? What's the status of the ocean? And that's a big question, which we don't have time to go into details here, but there are a couple of big studies that have answered this, certainly globally and also Australia-wide. Probably the best one to refer to uh, is the 2014 paper in Nature, which is about as highly um, regarded as you can get by Gray Medgar and others, where they concluded that the biomass of fish in the world's oceans is down by about two thirds on historical levels. And sharks in particular, so it's not all species that are affected the same way, pretty much the biggest species get affected the most, as a general rule. Sharks, which are the top of the tree, are down by over 90%. So that's a lot of, there are a lot of reasons for that, but one of the main reasons is extraction of those um, animals from the ocean by fishing pressure. That's globally, often we hear in response to that, well, hang on, Australia is not uh, in a bad way. Well, in fact, Australia is not much different. Um, our uh, biomass of fish in Australian waters has declined by 30% in the last 10 years. So I think we do need to do something about this. We need to tackle this depletion of biomass uh, because you get to a point where those populations are unsustainable and then you get fisheries collapse. So rather than me talk about my personal view, um, I thought I'd just show you the position of marine scientists in Australia. They recently revamped their position statement. This is available on the AMSA website, uh, released in December 29. There are a number of bullet points at the very beginning. The first one is MPAs are vital to conservation. So no question amongst marine scientists whether we should have them. They should be designed based on sound scientific principles. Um, really, unless the MPA is well designed and has an ecological impact, you're wasting your time. There's no point having an MPA that looks good on paper, makes um, managers feel good, but actually doesn't have an ecological consequence because it's just taking up space. And that means them being comprehensive, adequate and representative. And you can look up that ter those terms and what they mean. The consensus amongst scientists globally and now also acknowledged in Australia is we need at least 30% of the oceans to be in highly protected areas. Uh, basically, let's call them sanctuary zones. If we are to see recovery of biodiversity and biomass, if you have less than that, 20% will pretty much hold you in position, 10% might give you some impacts, but won't allow you to recover. So the 30 by 30 movement, 30% 30 of the oceans protected by 2030 is gaining momentum as a result of a lot of research behind this. And finally, uh, for an MPA to be effective, it's got to be well enforced. It's got to be big, in place for a long time and well located. So in other words, design matters. And if you do that, if you get effective marine protection, there are so many studies on this, I'll just summarise a few. Globally, studies have shown you get twice as many fish and five times the biomass. Why more biomass? Because you get more big fish. So the abundance is the count of fish and the biomass is the weight of fish. Fish grow bigger, they reproduce more, and so your biomass goes up. Uh, that's a global study, a study that I'm in the midst of um, publishing at the moment, which was 625 surveys around Southern Australia, pretty much from Port Stephens to Perth, found that effective marine protected areas, no take zones, have 1.3 times the richness, two and a half times the biomass, three and a half times the large fish biomass. And the question of whether or not MPAs spill over into surrounding areas and therefore benefit surrounding fisheries, is well addressed in this paper by Di Lorenzo, and the answer is yes, they do. Uh, interestingly, in the research that I did, I interviewed people, 439 people around the Great Southern Reef, and found that 92% of them uh, agreed with having marine reserves which restricted fishing, and the number was virtually no different between people who fished and people who didn't. So it's interesting in terms of this view that these aren't well accepted 
Uh, if you just go and talk to people, see the trouble is a lot of these studies don't control their sampling and so they'll have a web survey. Well, that's gonna get hammered by people with particular interests. Whereas if you just go and introduce yourself to people in a coastal setting and interview them, then you get a true sample. And when you sample like that, you get these figures. So one of the statements we're making in the paper, which is currently under review, is that full marine protected areas, sanctuary zones, are well understood, supported and valued by the public. And people perceive them to have better marine life, which is in keeping with their actual results. So not only do they have better marine life, people feel they do, they, they see better marine life, they experience improvements directly. And so they have this belief, which is in keeping with reality. So let's now look locally. Uh, so there were some global and then uh, Southern Australian. So, you know, Southern half of Australia, draw a line halfway through Oz and go down. That was the last study. These are now figures from Sydney. Uh, last week we did a uh, webinar, a Reef Life Survey did a webinar on Sydney's numbers based on 10 years of data. Basically the green is the sanctuary zones in Sydney, which is pretty much Shiprock and Cabbage Tree Bay. And the yellow is partially protected areas, places like Bronte, Coogee, um, Narrabeen, those other aquatic reserves. And red is the areas that are outside reserves. You can see pretty much the partially protected areas don't do anything, which is in keeping with the findings of the paper we're currently publishing. The fully protected areas have a big uplift in fish biomass and richness. Now the scale on the biomass is a log scale. So it's a power of 10. So it's not 50% more fish. It's, I don't know, 10 to the power of 1.5, but it's maybe double or two and a half times the fish biomass. Fish richness on the right hand side, so more biodiversity in uh, marine protected areas. And you can see it goes up and down a bit. That's because there are cyclical arrivals of tropical species coming down on the East Australian current. So you get these big surges in uh, fish, fish richness in particularly warm years. So we're seeing, a, we're seeing in these two graphs very clear evidence of two big impacts. One, fishing pressure is suppressing fish populations. And two, um, warming of our oceans is bringing increasing surges of species down from the East Australian current, from the, from the tropics. And that's also affecting not just fish, but also uh, invertebrates. Generally around Southern Australia, invertebrates are in decline, similar to fish, but some species aren't in decline. And in particular, the barren for forming urchin, Centrostephanus rogersi, is increasing in numbers because it's benefiting from having its predators removed. Big lobsters and big snapper and other big fish are the only things that can eat these urchins. We've taken them out of the ocean and so these urchins are having a party. You can see the general trend for Centrostephanus rogers eye, the gray graph is going up over time. That's in Sydney. You can see that that, that is suppressed somewhat by marine protected areas, particularly fully protected areas. In the lower graph, you see there are less urchins in the fully protected areas. That's because there's more big fish to eat them. And the trouble with urchin barons is they basically replace kelp because the urchins are vociferous uh, consumers of kelp. And so we're now at the start, I don't have a time series for kelp, um, but we do know that there's uh, almost four, well, there's around 40% more barrens than there is kelp now in Sydney. So 20% of our photo quadrants have kelp in them, 27% are barrens. So we're seeing declines in, in uh, habitat, as well as growth in barrens, those two are related. On the commercial side, you know, can we afford to have marine protected areas? A study that's just come out by Waldron has looked at the uh, cost versus the economic benefit of marine protected areas. And they basically conclude that um, the benefits of marine protected areas outweigh the cost by a ratio of about five to one. And that's because there's an uplift in tourism, ecosystem services, all the things that nature does for us is basically ecosystem services and also mitigating the effects of climate change, particularly if you have reserves in places like estuaries where they can suppress the effects of rising sea levels. Currently 22 nations have committed 
to the target of 30% by 2030. Uh, not, that's not Australia. And so finally, in conclusion, we've talked really about three big pressures, tropicalization, um, heavy fishing pressure and loss of habitat. We know what needs to be done. The science is fairly clear on this. We need to get our CO2 emissions down. We need more fully protected areas and we need better water quality. Um, to me, the question isn't, is the science clear? The question is, do we have the appetite to do the things that need to be done?